chapter number 2, your finger in John 4, and we'll probably have to stop after John 4 and pick up 1 Peter 1 next Wednesday night. We're talking, and uh, the sheet should have come around. You should have gotten uh, some of your notes, and uh, I jumped ahead a lesson. I did not realize it. I should have been studying lesson 8. But uh, instead, I jumped to Lesson 9 and totally looked over the lesson on discipleship. So we'll get to that. We'll, we'll jump back a lesson here in the next couple of weeks and uh, get to the lesson on discipleship. But man, what a great, great lesson tonight. Real worship. We're going through Dr. Paul Chapel's study on real church and uh, the, the various aspects of what the church is supposed to look like what the church is supposed to do, how the church is supposed to function according to the teachings of the New Testament. Worship is the sacred privilege of every child of God. Now, there's no doubt that there's great confusion in our day concerning who it is we're to worship and how we are to worship God. But Jesus outlined it very simply. Jesus taught the woman at the well that we are to worship God in what? Spirit and in truth. That is exactly right. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Listen to what the Bible says. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. As newborn babies, we're to desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones. That's a very important phrase. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. That's another important uh, uh, phrase. And holy priesthood, you ought to underline uh, these phrases, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. The word worship, when we talk about worship, probably all of us, have different images or different thoughts that come into our mind. Some envision monks uh, performing uh, silent duties in a monastery or uh, uh, chanting uh, different, uh, making different types of noises, chanting different uh, types of sounds. Uh, others think of worship in terms of emotional music that uh, evokes responsive feelings. But what is it? that is real worship. How does God define it? And how does he instruct us to offer it to him? Well, in Psalm 95, if you want to flip there real quick, you can. It's not hard to find. But in Psalm 95, listen to what the psalmist said. The psalmist said, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God. And a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his. And he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. You see, real worship is the act of a reverent heart. Real worship is the act of a reverent heart. Now... I don't want you to get the idea, and, and I believe we've gone through a study on this. If not, I'm going to go back and look. If we've not, we're going to. But I don't want you to get the idea that worship is all about music. Absolutely not. According to the Word of God, music is just one-fifth of an aspect of worship. Public praying, public reading of the Word of God, the proclamation of the Word of God, giving, all of these are a part of worship. And so we can't just focus on one at the exclusion of the other four. And so tonight, we're not going to really get into that. Uh, we're going we're to look more at what Christ taught about how we worship. Uh, real worship is the act of a reverent heart. Worship comes from the words worth 
and ship. Thus, worship is the way is the way we ascribe worth toward another. So, worship. If you want a working definition, worship means to prostrate oneself in homage, to do reverence to, or to adore. You know what? We worship what we believe is worthy. We worship who we believe is worthy. We see the wise men of Matthew chapter 2 doing this in the gifts they brought to Jesus Christ. Verse 11 of Matthew 2 says, And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child and Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. You see, worship is an attitude of the heart that is expressed in actions. When you and I worship God, we come to Him with a recognition of who He is and with a desire to express our feelings of adoration unto Him. We adore Him. We bow before Him. If we don't bow the knee, we bow our heart in worship and adoration to Him. There's no lack of, of worship in the world today, but much of that worship is misdirected. Now, how do I know that? Well, you think with me about entertainers. You think with me about sports icons. You think with me about stone idols, superheroes. They're all lavished with worship, but it's misdirected worship. Uh, during holiday seasons, bookstores report that the most frequently purchased types of books, number one, are cookbooks, and number two, are diet books. Now think about that. The cookbooks tell you how to prepare the food and the diet books tell you not to eat any of it. Amen? Many, many folks approach worship in the same way. They, they approach worship with a double mind. The human heart is made for worship, so they worship something. But they misdirect, divide, or confuse their worship. You know what the Bible teaches? Scripture teaches us that God is the only one worthy of worship and adoration. You ought not worship the preacher, amen? You ought not worship the singer. You ought not worship the church, amen? I mean, Blue Ridge View is a great church. We got a great view, but we don't worship the view. We don't worship the church. Matter of fact, this, God forbid it should happen, but this building could burn down. But the church would still be here. We're the church, and we worship one God. You know what? We may grow so much that we have to move off of this mountain. <gasps> Preacher, did you say that? I sure did. We may have to relocate one day to have more space, to do more things, to reach more people. So we, 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 you know what? I've been here 17 years. I can say this. This is not a sacred cow, amen? I mean, it's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful place, but we don't come to worship where we worship. We come to worship who we worship, amen? I think that makes sense anyway. Uh, Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive... Now, some of you turn me off and you're already mad at me. Don't, don't be mad. Take it up with the Lord. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Revelation chapter 5, listen, verse 11, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power. Be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. You see, real worship comes from the heart that finds an outlet in actions to express love for Jesus Christ. So our text for this lesson beginning out spells out some specifics regarding how we express our worship to the Lord. So if you've got your notes and you're filling in the blanks, number one, write this down, the people of worship. The people of worship. Now, the unsaved world most definitely uh, can misdirect their worship, and, and they do. Uh, but as God's people, we know who we worship, and we rejoice in the privilege of worshiping Jesus with our church family. 
1 Peter 2 identifies Christians. This is why I told you to underline some of these words. 1 Peter 2 identifies Christians with two titles, both of which point out the importance of our worship being directed to Christ. 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. To whom coming as unto a living stone, there's one, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also, listen, as lively stones, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. So really it's lively stones and priesthood that we should focus on right here. He says, he talks about the lively stones. Now you and I know that Jesus is the chief cornerstone of the church. Amen? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, the Bible says Jesus is the chief cornerstone. But we're connected to Jesus, and here we're called a living stone. We're lively stones that make up the spiritual house of the church. The church is not comprised of the physical building in which we meet. It's built of the lively stones that are solidly connected to Christ through salvation and to one another in the church. So as a spiritual building, the Bible, Paul says, we are the pillar and ground of truth, responsible to lift the truth high for all to see. 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul said in verse 15, But if I tarry long, that thou may knowest how, or mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house, house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. So he talks about the lively stones that we are, but also he, he describes us as priests, the believer priests. Not only does 1 Peter 2 refer to us as, as those lively stones, but it also says, Peter says, we're a holy priesthood. Scripture teaches that Jesus, of course, is the high priest. And that through our faith in his sacrifice for our sins, we are believer priests. We have direct access to God to offer the spiritual sacrifices of worship. Amen? You and I have direct access to God. We are a holy priesthood. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that that veil in the temple was torn. You and I now, we don't have to go to a priest to... to confess our sin and to atone for our sin, though we can go to God directly through His Son, Jesus Christ. Young or immature Christians sometimes identify worship as only what happens on the platform in a church service. Now think about this. They view it as somebody who performs special music or someone who leads in prayer, and those are the ones that are really worshiping. But in reality, all of us in the church are to be the people of worship. Amen? Listen, we, we, don't, come to, we don't come to view. We come to participate. I'm, I'm not the entertainer. You're not the audience. No, we're all worshiping God as the people of the church. It's not just the platform presence that's involved in worship. It is to be every member of the church, all of us who are a part of the spiritual house, who worships the Lord. You know what Gina does as she's leading the music? She is leading us to worship Him. We're not worshiping her. When I preach, you're not worshiping me. I am leading us to worship Him according to the Word of God. Uh, the people who are to worship the Lord include every member of the local church. So the people of worship, but notice, second of all, notice the priority of worship. And here's, here's where we'll finish. The priority of worship. Uh, go ahead and be flipping over to John 4, verses 20 through 24. You know this story. Uh, you probably know it very well. It recounts uh, Christ's encounter with the woman at the well. And uh, as Jesus begins to strike up a conversation with this woman, first of all, Jesus is a great example. Meeting up with sinful people. You know, sometimes we get so concerned about, about ourselves and we ought to hang around the right people. You know what? Sometimes we need to be hanging with the wrong people. Amen? I didn't say partaking in what they're doing. We need to be building relationships with them. Christ is the example of that. You know where Christ went? He went to publicans. He went to sinners. You know what? He went to wine bibbers. 
That's a, that's a whole other message. But through their conversation, Christ gave two priorities that must be in place if true worship is going to be offered. No, if you read through John 4, you find the background to the verses that, that I'm about to read. You, you know, you've learned, we, we've preached through it. At midday, Jesus arrives at the well, and, and he's very weary. He's tired. His throat is parched. He's, he's thirsty. And, and there he met a woman to whom we refer to as the woman at the well. Because of the heat in Palestine, most women, they would not collect uh, during the heat of the day. Matter of fact, that was kind of a gathering place for the ladies. They may go in the morning or they may go uh, late in the evening. Uh, but they would go there and they would gather together. But this woman is here in the heat of the day, in the middle of the day, on a hot day, and she's by herself. And so uh, a lot of Bible teachers and scholars uh, think that she is a social outcast. And Jesus uh, kind of backs this up. He's sitting there and, and uh, Jesus, who has compassion on all people, she asked this, he asked this woman for a drink. And she expresses shock that Jesus would ask her for water, number one, because he's a Jew, and number two, she's a woman, and number three, she's a Samaritan woman. The, the Jews thought the Samaritans were dogs. The Samaritans hated uh, uh, the Jews. And Jewish men had very little to do out in public with women, so there's a lot going on here. So, so Christ, uh, she's she's shocked that he would even ask her for water, and Jesus responds by telling her, "Hey, I know who you are. I, I know that you have had five husbands, and you're shacking up with a man right now that you're not even married to." And then he says, "You know what? If you knew who it was that was asking you for this water." you would actually be asking me for living water. And so Christ begins to present the truth to her. And uh, when he tells her that he knows who she is and what she's involved in, she says, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And so this sparks a conversation. Uh, she really tries to change the subject, but it sparks a conversation about worship and the priorities in worship. Notice what, what's said in verse 20. Our fathers, she says, worshiped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. And then listen to what he says. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So by the end of the conversation, the woman at the well had not only put her faith in Jesus Christ, but she went to witness to others as well. That is the natural reaction of a life truly changed. When Christ changes us and saves us, we want to tell somebody. We want others to know. But, but go back to Christ's statement in verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So two priorities that Christ gives here for real worship. Number one, we worship in the spirit. We worship in the spirit. The spirit of man is that part of man that has the ability to fellowship with the Lord. This part is brought to life uh, at the salvation, at salvation by God's Holy Spirit. So we can only worship in the spirit if we've been born again by the spirit. When we worship in spirit, we're worshiping God with our spirit, which the Holy Spirit has empowered to do it, has enabled to do it. John 3, verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. You see, a lost man can't worship God. That's why his worship is misdirected. Only those that have been saved by grace, only those that have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within them can truly worship God and worship Him in spirit. At the moment we trust Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit of God takes up residence in our lives. Ephesians 1, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, 
in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. It is the Holy Spirit of God that enables us to worship in a way that's pleasing to God. In fact, it's the Holy Spirit himself who stirs in our hearts the very desire to worship God in truth and in spirit. I believe with all of my heart if a person is truly born again, they can't come in here and not worship or not have the desire to worship. One of the ways you know you're saved is that you have a desire to worship Almighty God. You got a desire to, to sing. You got a desire to read the Word of God. You have a desire uh, to pray. You have a desire to give, to sing. John 16, how be it when he, the Spirit of the truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. You know what the Holy Spirit of God does? It, he glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Listen, any, any parade that marches anything or anyone above Jesus Christ is not of God. I'm talking about in the religious realm. You hear a lot of these ministries and all they talk about is the Holy Spirit, the anointing, being baptized in the Spirit. Always remember, Jesus said the Holy Spirit has come or will come to glorify me. Just think, just think about that. So we worship in the Spirit, but we worship in the truth. If we're going to worship God in truth, we must first accept the truth. Uh, as Jesus and the woman at the well conversed, she, she tried to divert the conversation and talk about the location of worship rather than the object of worship. And people still do that today. As you try to speak to them about Christ, you know what they'll say? They'll say, well, you know, I go down here to this church. I, I go uh, uh, to St. Mary's or I'm a Lutheran. Or I go down to the Methodist church. But listen to me. True worship is not about a place. True worship is about a person. Jesus. When Christ told the woman that salvation is of the Jews, he was referring to himself as the Messiah and Lord. In John 14, Christ clearly states that he's the only way to the Father. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So any person or church who teaches that there's any other way to heaven than through Jesus and his blood, they don't understand the truth. Much less do they understand true worship. So always remember, true worship centers around Jesus Christ. Now, a group may have a worship service where they sing, give, light incense, whatever you want to call it, teach, chant, but if they don't lift up Jesus Christ in truth, then they've not had biblical worship. A lot, of, a lot of people today confuse worship with emotion. I, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. You know, some people think that, you know, just because uh, uh, the praise group comes out and sings or the praise band has a jam session, uh, they experience an emotional high and they think they're worshiping the Lord. But then that same church preaches the word of God and lifts up Jesus. The people wish the sermon was shorter and they want to get out in a hurry. Now, something's wrong there. Amen? That's not worship. That's emotion. And I know emotions are involved in worship. Emotions are involved in worship. Listen to me. We've got to, we've got to worship in all aspects of worship. Worship is not a, about a feeling. It's about Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the truth. True spirit-filled worship will no doubt include emotion, but the emotion is not the center. Jesus is the center. I would love for everybody to go out every Sunday and, and not, not necessarily say, Preacher, what a sermon. Gina, what a song the choir sang. You know what? When, when we really worship, we'll go out and say, Man, what a Savior. What a God. Because we, we focused on Him. Uh, emotion is simply a heart-level response to the truth. 
Uh, as Jesus talked with the woman in John 4, he didn't budge from the truth. He didn't say, you know, uh, you know, you worship at Mount Gerizim and I worship in Jerusalem. At least, at least we both worship somewhere. And as long as you worship, that's the most important thing. I'm, I'm sorry I bothered you. But Jesus didn't say that. He firmly and lovingly told her she must believe the truth in order to worship in spirit and in truth. Well, one preacher said, and I believe this, I believe it with all my heart. He said, it's better to be divided by truth than to be united in error. A lot of people say, a lot of people say, well, you know what? The number one thing that, that a church must have is love. The number one thing that a church must have is unity and harmony. No, my friend, the number one thing that a church ought to have is the truth of the Word of God. And do you know what? Sometimes the truth divides. I would rather be preaching the Word of God in a church that doesn't like it than to be preaching in a church and all they want to talk about is loving each other. Preach the truth. He said it's better to be divided by truth than to be united in error. It's better to stand alone with truth than to be wrong with a multitude. It's better to ultimately succeed with truth than to temporarily succeed with a lie. And the tendency in our culture today, in our environment today, is to compromise the truth so we don't appear to be harsh and judgmental. How many times have you heard that? Well, you're judging me. Friend, listen to me. The most loving thing we could ever do is te tell people the truth. Man, if, if, if your little baby gets out of the nursery and runs down to the road, and, and your toddler gets down in the middle of the road, the most loving thing that I can tell you is your child is in the road, and if you don't go get them, they're going to get run over and killed. So we're not doing the right thing when we withhold the truth just because we want to avoid persecution or confrontation. Sometimes we have to tell the truth. Compromise is not only unkind, compromise is ungodly. Amen? Unfortunately, the truth about Christ and salvation through Him alone is often rejected. That's why I get so upset when, when people say, well, the Bible says... Judge not that you be not judged. They have no idea the context of that verse. No idea. When I, when I preach the Bible verse by verse and we happen to run across uh, in the Bible, see, I, I don't have to ask you your felt needs. You know, I don't have to send out a survey and say, what would you have me to preach on? You know, I'm going to put a box back there. And you tell me, you tell me what you would have me... Listen, if you're here long enough, and if we study the Bible long enough, we're going to hit it. We're going to get to it, amen? Um, so, I don't know how I got off on that. There are those who reject Christ, and instead of preaching His death, burial, and resurrection, you know what we want to talk about? We want to talk about save the planet. We want to speak on Earth Day, equal rights, social concerns, to the exclusion of preaching the truth. But real churches that engage in real worship preach Jesus and His salvation. 1 Corinthians 1, I'm closing with this. But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, and under the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, to simply worship isn't enough. We've got to worship in spirit and in truth. And when you love Jesus... The Holy Spirit prompts a deep desire in your soul to worship Him. And then next week, we'll look at the practice of worship. Father, thank You again tonight for allowing us to gather and study Your Word. Lord Jesus, we thank You for what it teaches us. And Lord, I pray that we have learned some things about worship tonight. Maybe some things that, that we looked over. Maybe some things from the Word of God we've never seen. Lord, uh, may we always be reminded that worship is all about you. It's not about the place we meet. It's not about the location we're at. It's not about anything else. It's not about who's taking part in the worship. It is all about you. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would keep it that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Don't forget to come look at the t-shirts. If you want one of these golf shirts, just sign up down here. And give us a size. Make sure you put golf shirt beside it. And then 845 Sunday morning, 10 o'clock Sunday school, 11 o'clock worship. Hey, 
Bring somebody with you. God bless you.